we cannot call Beethoven, ask him, is it F or F sharp? In your autograph is F, in the first edition is F sharp. Hello, my name is Wolf-Dieter Seifert, and this is Living the Classical Life. Wolf-Dieter, I'm so, so thrilled to have you oh. on this show for a very different kind of conversation here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm so honored. I wanted to start out by telling you that I had a misconception about the Henley Company. I always assumed, as performer who grew up with these editions, that because these editions were so closely aligned with music from... from Bach to the Romantics, that I assumed that this company was around since the 19th century or perhaps <laughs> earlier. But I recently learned that it was in 1948 that it was formed with the permission of the U.S. military government. That's correct. What is this connection all about? Yeah, that, that's an interesting story. You're right. Uh, actually, we are the youngest music publisher in the classical field in Germany. Uh, if you look at all the competitors, how old they are. I mean, Breitkopf and Hertel, 300 years, and uh, Schott, 250 years. So we only 70 years now, uh, youngsters. Um, we all owe the, um, the whole thing to Günther Henle. He founded that company right after the Second World War. And uh, he grew up in München. So his idea was, OK, let's have this music company in his kind of hometown. And as you know, uh, in, the, in these years, the Americans were... Uh, there. Uh, were there. <laughs> and you need the uh, approval of their um, authorities. And um, um, actually, Günther Hindle wrote an autobiography, and he uh, tells the long story about the short fact that because he knew uh, the officer through another guy... Uh, it was not that much difficult to get the stamp. The, mo the bigger problem were to, uh, to get the printing paper. That was uh, elementary problems in those years. Yeah. But how about Gunter Henley himself? How did he get involved in music? Because I, I understand that he was a politician and an industrialist. Um, he was a passionate pianist. Uh, he grew up in playing the piano. I think he, he thought to become a pianist. He was very gifted. Uh, his beloved pieces were Brahms, violin sonatas. He played all the, 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 the great repertoire of the classical music. And then uh, his parents asked him to, to study something serious. Uh, and so he, he became a lawyer. And his idea was to become um, uh, yeah, um, an ambassador of Germany. That was his idea. Then he met this uh, wonderful Anneliese... Um, Klöckner, and he married this daughter of the industrialist Peter Klöckner, the steel industry. Mm -hmm. And so the story went on, and he became a big industrialist. But he always was very passionate about music. So it was, to make it short, it was a kind of a hobby. And being a businessman, he found out that all these editions um, uh, circulated in, in his, when he was young, and when he studied the music, were bad, were of bad quality because uh, they uh, they did not represent the ur text. They did not represent the real thing. So he said, "Okay." Um, and in an interview in the in the fifties with him, he says, "Okay, I just started that company with uh, with the idea to uh, to publish um, the best possible text and the best possible product quality for." let's say, a couple of titles, and that's it. And think about how this company developed. So for a non-music person who is watching and, and listening and, and sort of getting the essence of the conversation with regards to mu printed music and, and how it relates to performers, what is Urtext? I mean, for, for me, growing up as a pianist, yeah. 
I, I knew that there were different types of editions, and I would see that there's this word urtext, and yeah. and the teachers would say that's what you need. But right. what what really is urtext? Okay, the okay. That? I have a couple of answers to this question. First of all, it's like you said before, it's a very clever marketing term because nobody really knows what urtext means. And to be honest, it's not a clear, crystal clear definition. It's not possible. Mm. It's a gray zone uh, term. That's the reason why it is so successful. You cannot sell uh, the, the great art, the great music without their claiming urtext today. Thanks to Günther Händel and our company, mm. I have to say. Uh, so uh, this is the one thing. Uh, but what is it? What is the meaning of urtext? That was your question. It's 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 a ger typical German word. It consists of ur. Your Americans say ur. Ur. Ur text. Ur text. Ur text. It's ur and the text. A text I don't have to explain. It's a lot of graphics and uh, uh, words. But the ur. What does the ur mean? The ur is a very old German word, uh, essentially meaning far back into history, back to the roots, mm -hmm. back to back to the origins. You have a similar word in English, it's pure. In the pure you have the ur or origin. But if you really think about this and you go back to the first things, like the, the first score, the first appearance of a music piece, it's of course it's a sketching or it's the autograph, the handwriting of the composer. But urtext does not mean this. Uh, otherwise we would just facsimile uh, the, the, the score. Uh, then that's it. No, no, that's... And that's my third answer. Urtext is a philological method. It's an editing method. You can learn this. It's a scholarly um, method. And the method means we have to collect all authentic documents, all the witnesses of a piece of music, which is sketches, drafts, autographs, uh, scores, um, uh, copies by copyists, early prints, proofreadings, even letters by Beethoven correcting things. All these together are authentic sources. You know, I don't think most people realize that <laughs> all that goes into just one edition. Exactly. We cannot call Beethoven and ask him, is it F or F sharp? In your autograph is F, in the first edition is F sharp. We have to have a certain experience with his handwriting, with... Uh, with the way uh, a composition makes it way until the, the print, um, because there's a big difference between a manuscript, which is an individual, it's a one uh, original document. The print, as the name already says, is a um, duplication. Ur text philologically is a reconstruction to, to get the best text possible, which comes as close as possible to the to the will and the wish of the author. Maybe there is no single, no, there is no single score, um, authentic score existing, which really represents the final last word. It's our obligation as a scholar, as editors, to find out, to correct the mistakes. Why is it so necessary to use urtext edition instead of an edited, arranged music text? Mm -hmm. Because, as being a serious musician, I think you should know what the author, the originator, the composer wanted. And how do you know what he wa or she wanted? Yeah, isn't that a bit interpretive in, in of exactly, itself? Exactly, exactly. So my answer, why is it so important to use the word text, um, uh, is the obligation of a serious musician to really try to base uh, his or his, uh, interpret her interpretation on the best text possible. Because otherwise, you play list through the glasses of Paderewski or, or Clem uh, Beethoven through the eyes of Czerny because uh, they add their interpretation into the graphics. And you're right, also we as scholars are not always 100% sure about the meaning. So my last word um, about explanation what urtext means, it's not only the, the engraving, the score, the music score, it's also the so-called critical apparatus. It's the, it's the explanation of which scores are we using, have we, uh, did we use, uh, 
which uh, do we prioritize? And if there are readings, as we call it, so differences between uh, the scores, and we cannot really decide which is the best thing, we we have to decide for one option, and the other option is in the critical apparatus. As an as a suggestion for you as a user, maybe you should use F sharp. Yeah. <laughs> why why not? Uh, it's possible. So if we're drawing this distinction, again for people who don't know, and maybe this includes some musicians, if we're looking at this world now, we've really laid out how complicated this word <laughs> urtext is. Yeah. If we compare that to say, okay, Beethoven sonatas, and we have a performer like Arthur Schnabel, yeah. who performed and recorded all of them and created his own edition. What's the difference? Are, are we going to see, say, a dynamic marking, a crescendo starting right. here, which was not necessarily exactly. written by Beethoven? And uh, is it our obligation to also examine such a non text edition as a performer? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, um, if you take it really serious, I think you are not allowed to play a forte when Beethoven writes a piano. Uh, it's not your freedom to decide, okay, I don't like this crescendo here, which Beethoven writes, I do, I do a decrescendo. No, you're not allowed to do this. This is my opinion. But uh, this is only the elementary things. I mean, in the, um, uh, in the real interpretation, in the real um, world for interpreter, uh, there are so many questions to answer and to realize a music text because sometimes you don't have a, a dynamic marking. You have to you have to find your own, mm -hmm. or a slurring or um, whatever articulation. So uh, there are hundreds thousands of uh, um, options for you still using the ur text. So these scores contain rules and regulations you are not allowed to break. Um, like I said before, um, if there is a forte which uh, Beethoven wrote, you have to play a forte. But which forte? How loud is your forte on your instrument, in that recording, in that uh, surrounding? So you're, you have so many options to interpret the, the urtext signs, so there is still a lot of uh, freedom. Uh, and if Schnabel uh, has his idea how to interpret Beethoven, so his, his personal interpretation, it's fantastic, and it's fantastic that he uh, even spanned his fingerings mm -hmm. for for his students and for uh, for us and i should make a note on the handle library app the digital app because we published the schnabel fingering in our app on top of the beethoven urtext edition of handle you can click on schnabel's name and his all his fingerings uh, appear and you can click and it, it, it disappears. Yes, it's fantastic. I didn't know about this Yeah, the fingering uh, feature is the most, I, I mean, the most used at the moment, our app. It's a fantastic feature. We have also Claudio Arouse fingering on your fingertip or non no fingerings at all. You can do your own fingerings. So this is a fantastic thing with the app. So I only learned about this, this app um recently, and we'll go into that in, in a minute, but I'm, I'm so curious to know, for you as the publisher of this, this word or text, mm -hmm. what do you make of these conversations when you overhear a teacher saying, say, <laughs> in one of these theatrical yeah, yeah. masterclass settings, oh, you have to be faithful to the score, and the, the student uh, has some sort of reaction to that. Do all of these people really, uh, you know, understand everything that's, that's going into that? <laughs> Is the teacher always correct? I would say no. Mm -hmm. When they were young, I mean, especially the older generation, Urtext was already there, but they were maybe using older edition, a heavily annotated edition. They used the, the Arau Peters edition, for instance, and they learned this music with these old scores. And as being a musician, you, you're a visual uh, type of, of human. Many people think uh, musicians are oral, Orientated. That's mm -hmm. not true. You're visual. I'm a visual learner Man. in all capacities. Many of visual your learner. colleagues yes. are like yeah. this. Yeah. So once you learn the Beethoven Sonata, a Bach prelude by heart, you 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 have an inner vision, uh, an inner view of the score, and it's very hard for you to change to an Urtext edition with another layout, maybe even with different notes or slow. So that's the problem of the generations. I tell you a story as a secret, a secret for this movie. <laughs> Günther Henle grew up with Peter's editions, and he learned all the repertoire 
uh, playing from the green uh, scores. He never used his own editions. He said, I learned this with Peters. Um, so you, you for, understand for this reason, point. because he was used to the he layout. was used to it to the layout. It was so hard to change. I mean, it's I'm exaggerating the the story, but uh, he once told this. Uh, so once you learned a piece really seriously, you wouldn't very uh, much like to change the score you are using. Maybe you change it as a teacher for your students because you want to use the Urtext edition. Then it comes up to the problem that the student might play the F sharp. You learn the F and stop, stop, what's what's going wrong here? This is a wrong note. The student says, no, in the handler Urtext, there's F sharp. Said, no, that's wrong. It's impossible. It sounds ugly. I have many examples of this. So it takes a long time. It took a long time for Günther Handler and his products to really come into the market. Now it, the, the story goes the other way around. Now all the people are using Urtext editions and all the other old editions are, are gone. They disappear from the market. So to answer your question, Question. No, I don't think that, um, that professors, that teachers all, always know the truth. It's really hard to know the truth. But more and more are really into this topic of good scores, of scholarly scores. They even read the critical commentary sometimes or the footnotes and then they know that there is no the urtext. There is a variety of uh, urtext editions with uh, some minor discrepancies, but the the broader um, um, audience would never recognize if you play from an uh, edited text or an Ur text. No. Well, I'm, I'm glad we're having this discussion exactly for this reason, because I, I'm keeping in mind maybe a risk if a young performer is only about following the rules and regulations, no. right? Because if they haven't compared editions, then they don't necessarily understand why that's important so that they can rise above right. what is the map of the music Correct. and to rise above a certain meaning yes where the music comes to life but i can also reinforce your point that for me when i'm performing from memory i always see the score i always see yeah. where i am on the page of yeah, that that's, score I know. to I know. the extent when if for example i've i've been given a, a new score a new edition of, uh, I'm, I'm collaborating with, say, a violinist, and I'm given a new, fresh, fresh score. Yeah. I f sometimes feel like I can't do it. I, I feel like I haven't seen this music before. Yes, isn't it uh, interesting? Well, I'm fascinated to hear you talk about the visual element, because I have to say, without specifically naming Henley, I would say that for me as a performer growing up, I realized that by using a different edition and how it was laid out visually, yeah. yes. I became a better or worse sight reader. Absolutely. Uh, you know, many times I meet musicians around the world that tell me, you know, with Handler scores, it's so much easier to sight read, to, to study, to understand scores. And it's really an art. I mean, the, the music engraving is an art. These people, uh, in those years, when I came to Handler in the early 90s, they did it by hand in the metal plates. Really? It was not a software like today. So it was an art you have to learn. There's a handcraft, and they have a very good knowledge about the spacing. The spacing is very important. The, the slurring, how many bars in one accolade. If it's a fast movement, like a presto, you have much more bars in the line than in an adagio. These are the secrets behind the layout of a good engraving. And I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that until today, uh, we think we have the, the best and the most beautiful uh, engraving and lay we call still call it engraving, engraving. but it's of course right. it's so we we are using a standard software uh, but our engravers only a few all over the world um, uh, using this tool but you know the real work starts after the input of the of the music basics it's the spacing you have to do by hand with a good eye so f from from that standpoint mm. What goes into, who, deci who decides and who designs this aesthetic? Who, deci who decides mm -hmm. how, how big the bars have to be, how yeah. wide, um, what kind of elegant script there needs to be to make it more readable? Are people yeah. discussing this? Yes. How, how does that work? Sometimes we still discuss things. But to be honest, these are such experts. These music engravers have such a great knowledge about the aesthetics of a score 
and they have so much training, they have so much knowledge by doing this all through their life. So uh, it you can learn the things. There are rules. You are not allowed to stand this like this, and the quarter rest must be like this. These are the rules and the algorithms of the software. They already they they already do this. Just you to just put in um, the con the information and the algorithm gives prints out something but it looks ugly it is hard to read hard to understand but if you have an uh, idea of a static score this goes back to the hand engraving of the 18th and 19th century these masters of engraving and uh, i cannot ex i cannot really explain uh, why this score is better than this one it's an individual handcraft whether you know to, uh, how to do it or you don't know. Performers will form a really close emotional relationship to their score oh, yeah. and find even comfort in the fact that this, this is the, the surface that yes. you've been working with. Yeah. And, and do you think that this accounts for the fact that, I'm sure you've witnessed this too, people get really worked up about the differences of editions? Yes. <laughs> you know, I, I, know, you know. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Because scores are not books. Scores, uh, mu sheet music, is not like a book. It is a tool for you as a musician. You work with this, like you said before, your whole life. If you uh, come back to a sonata after many, many years, you go to your shelves and you put it out and you read it again. You have joy. You remember things. Maybe you remember your teaching process. So there is a very... Um, close relationship to that tool. So here's what I'm curious uh, to quickly walk through because I, even I as a performer don't know what this looks like. So basically if you decide to come up with a, a, a new volume, yeah. just for example Schubert Impromptus, right. walk me through the process from start to finish. <laughs> oh. How long does this take? Yes. What teams are involved? So with Schubert we need to know where are the primary sources, the authentic sources. With Schubert, it's, it's easy because there's the Deutschverzeichnis. There is a work list. Uh, we will have no difficulties to get copies, photocopy scans of all the necessary sources. We have to collect them. Okay, the job of the editor begins and he or she compares every single sign, symbol, uh, note, every single um, um, visual, documented sign in all these sources. And of course, believe me, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of differences. And if you are not a, a character who can decide on things, you are not a good editor. Editing means a knowledge of um, the philological method and hopefully of Schubert's handwriting because it's very special. Mm -hmm. And if uh, given this, you have to have a character uh, which can decide. Because if you are hesitating, hours and hours, is it a staccato dot or a stroke? Is the slur to the third note or the fourth note? And you think about this years and years, you never will finish your job. A, a sort of on a level of, okay, some people might think of these as kind of nerdy differences. Do you, do you, <laughs> I know, I know. Do you, do you ever get angry letters saying, how dare you said that was an F sharp? <laughs> oh yeah, many, many such letters and, and emails. And it's really, it's really funny. Our customers, the target group, by we, for, for, we are doing all these things. The musicians, they really only look at the score. They even not read the footnote, which explains the F sharp. They sent me an email. I mean, I, can't, I could tell you names. <laughs> you would be surprised. At Handler, we are proud to have nine proofreadings. We have three. Uh, three readings, then it goes back to the project manager, he collects all the mistakes, it goes back to the engraver, then he corrects the, the proof. Then it goes in the second round, three proof readings. Again, third round, this is exceptional in the, in the, in the world of music publishing, I know. And it's still, I mean, we are proud to say our, our books are correct. We present the correct text, but to be honest, it's music engraving, the music layout is so difficult, so has so many varieties that there are still sometimes still a mistake on a page. So, I mean, with that many proofreadings, uh, that, that sounds like, well, from idea until printing, how long does that, is that nine years or something? <laughs> <laughs> no, that would be uh, commercially not, not a good 
uh, situation. <laughs> Let's say it like this. Uh, as a standard, once we have the engraving master copy, it takes one year. It takes one year from um, the engraving um, uh, Stichvorlage, engraving copy, to the result. One year is a long time. I mean, if I tell this to my colleagues in the book industry, they're just simply laughing. Yeah, it, it takes a long time to make a good product out of this. But um, the period uh, which, what, which takes to get this engraving copy may vary from one year to two years, three years. It depends on the time uh, the editor is investing in the, uh, and in the problems to get to receive their copies of their primary scores. With Schubert, I said before, it's not that, that difficult, but when, when it comes to to composers where their musicology has not collected all the information about the source, it maybe becomes very difficult. We have to to write many emails, to contact many librarians, to ask many people, where is the autograph? Is it, it still exists? We have to check uh, antiquarian catalogs. We have really to work on this, and it can be consume a lot of time. Maybe we find out it's impossible to do our text. Uh, because we have no access to the primary sources, and then then it's a nice idea, but we have to stop it. It, it sometimes happened like this, or there is a kind of political problem with, for instance, with Rachmaninoff. Mm -hmm. We have a very nice relationship now to the librarian uh, in the Glinka Museum, where we have access to the Rachmaninoff scores and uh, to many other things, and so uh, or in in the case of Janáček, we have a very nice the 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 director of the Janáček um, uh, Museum uh, in Brunn, in Brno, uh, maybe 10 years before we had no chance to, to, get, to get access to these sources. So we would not do the word text without these primary, uh, primary sources. I was wondering, you know, because at some point I became aware that uh, Henley would, would uh, go into the realm and world of Rachmaninoff. I said, yes. what goes into a decision like that? So it, it's, it's the access. To it's the, the access. Mm -hmm. Two things. The access to the sources and the public domain situation. Right. Handler is, you know, the only comp uh, company, uh, music company in the world who is strictly dedicated to the copyright free, to the public domain music. We do not have copyrights, with the big exception of Evgeny Kissin. It must be public domain. We would not be willing to pay any royalties or any licenses to uh, their companies who own, or their um, the families who, who own the copyrights. So this... These are the, the major, and that, that also already answers your next question. We are always a, about five years ahead of our programming because we know when Bartok, for instance, or Rachmaninoff uh, goes into the public domain, the next big name will be maybe Prokofiev or Shostakovich. This is fantastic. Okay, so you hit the, the, the magic concept of public domain. Public domain. So... For you as an established and respected publishing house, I'm thinking about the fact, how does a publishing house exist in the world today? Oh, yeah. It's changing so quickly. Oh, yes. Public domain, and I'm thinking about young musicians who don't often have a lot of money to spend on scores. Yes. You can go online and find public domain scores. How do you yes. try to make it so that they want to yes. buy a critical scholarly edition? This is a very good question. And I, I'm, I have different answers to this. The one thing is, of course, I have to say this, our scores are not expensive. If you look at the relationship between price and product, it's really cheap. Because as I said before, it's a tool you can use all your life through your lifetime. You can even with the Henley edition, the, the, the product quality is so good, you can give it to your kids. It's a privilege, it's a prestige to use a good instrument, and a good music book. If you play from a cheap uh, photocopy, it means something. Mm -hmm. It means something. So if I see on stage people uh, using a Stradivari and play from a, from a copied uh, a score, I think this person has no real idea about what he or she is doing because we spend so much energy, time, and money into a good product. And the musician should respect this, I think, and should respect the composer also with a good product. If we're talking about adaptations, yeah. I've only recently heard from some friends and colleagues about the Henley 
app. Ah. I actually don't know that much about it. So yeah. what, what was it about and what has been the reception from people who know and use it? Yeah, we, we were starting this five years ago. We're celebrating now the fifth birthday of this uh, Henley kit. And every day I'm very much happy about this app because the numbers are uh, growing immensely. Five years ago, it was a kind of a situation that a lot of younger musicians asked Handler, why don't you have an app? Why don't you present your scores in a digital format? And I was very skeptical. I love the product. I love the paper, to be honest. That's uh, me. Um, yeah. it, it's true. And, uh, and there are so many advantages, uh, which the, the biggest advantage of the product is the money, as you mentioned before. Uh, uh, to use the digital the handler app, you need, uh, you need an iPad, you need some uh, device. It, this costs a lot of money. Students cannot afford a 1,000 euro iPad easily. Think about how many scores you can buy for 1,000 euros. I mean, yeah. it's a whole library. So this is one of the big benefits of the paper. But um, there are many very interesting and helpful things we can only um, give to the musicians uh, in the digital format, not in the printed format. We were talking about the fingering, the selection of fingerings. It's impossible. Yehudi Menuhin, the close friend of Günther Händler, I have the letters, uh, suggested to Günther Händler, why don't you print your Urtext scores with uh, inserted uh, layers of fingering of different artists with their fingering, um, um, just to lay in, and you can put it in and out, this was the kind of idea we now have very easily in the digital format. You click on the name, you have Manuin's fingerings, and you click and it disappears. So these are things, and lots of kind of these things uh, are po only possible through the digital format. So with the fingerings, and I just have to quickly insert <laughs> this question because I, I know that for one of the Rachmaninoff editions, the fingerings are provided by Mark andre Hamelin, who was true. on this show, and, 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 and that struck me as of course, he's a, a pianist without limits, but I was surprised to hear that he doesn't himself play the music of Rachmaninoff. And so there he is providing the fingerings. How does that work? Um, we, we had a lot of talking with him about this. And actually, we did also a video interview with him. And uh, one of the questions was, why are there so, limit, so few fingerings? Because he's only there on, on a printed page, only a few fingerings, not very many. And he said, you know what? With Rachmaninoff, is so pianistic, is so clear, crystal clear what to do. I don't have to tell pianists what which finger to use. It's like with Chopin and with Liszt, these, these top piano uh, composers. It's it's um, obvious. Um, I doubt that he's not playing Rachmaninoff. I think he's exactly. playing Rachmaninoff exactly. a lot, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> a lot. Uh, but you're right. Uh, on stage, and uh, his recordings show that he's, uh, he is, he is care, um, careful with Rachmaninoff. By the way, it's not only one edition. He's our exclusive Rachmaninoff fingering um, uh, uh, pianist. And this maybe is the, the conclusion of your earlier question of the process, because uh, it's not only the engraving of the urtext, it's also the question who is doing the fingering for our editions and the bowing by, in the, with the string players. And we have uh, lots of contacts to very famous musicians around the world and professors, teachers. So sometimes we select like Mark andre for Rachmaninoff or uh, Murray Pariah for the new Beethoven sonatas. And they do all these works as a series. But sometimes we select or ask... Uh, uh, a very special work for a very special uh, artist because there was a wonderful recording or there was uh, something was impressed me very much myself or the chief editor and we were dis we are discussing these things and I think we have we found a very good mix of uh, pedagogic fingerings and artistic fingerings and um, these are, our authors are totally free what kind of fingerings they provide we will print this, what they give to give us. Thank you so much for joining us here on the show. Oh. It's been a real pleasure. <laughs> I have to admit, much more fascinating than I would have realized oh, at the so outset. Much. And thank we wish you continued success in going forward in the next hundred years. Thank you.
What is it, by the way? What is the classical life? Yeah, exactly. What is this? Is this classical in a in a very overarching sense, which could include you know actors, writers, whatever, you know, anything that's examined life.